Morris is a is a journalist, um, documentary filmmaker, based in Nairobi. Uh, done stories around. I've traveled across uh, more than forty. 40 counties for stories, uh, for filming documentaries, uh, interviews, and all that for just telling non-fictional stories and stories about uh, human interest stories, stories about social justice, stories about human rights, uh, good governance, and also investigations to do with corruption and things that are not working that would love to see work differently in the country. So exposing such kind of stuff, that's the kind of work I'm... I do and try to do. So, Maurice, before we get into understanding what's on your shelf, because that's why we're here, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, just on that pre- pretext of you being an award-winning journalist, what are mm-hmm. some of the major awards and recognitions you've received in your practice as a journalist? Mm. The, the 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 one that um, I think is most um, I don't know how to say uh, how to to say it, but the one that I uh, uh, has given me more opportunities um, was the first one was the one for Thompson Foundation Young Journalist of the Year a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that one was. Um, the one that made me get a passport, the one that got me out of the country, and I made a connection with one of the guys um, who, who who was also um, nominated for the award, who uh, we later worked together on an investigation to do uh, with poaching, but he also connected me with uh, uh, some organizations that have been uh, doing investigations for and getting a, a few grants from here and there from from then so i think that one has been more impactful because if i if i can think about uh, even the connection that i i had uh, how i started uh, getting into now the spaces of national geographic and all that was sorry was through uh, from thompson foundation whoever we were nominated with we ended up doing an investigation about poaching in Kenya, Tanzania, in South Africa, mm-hmm. and that and then that story uh, launched me into more into conservation, natural history, and mm-hmm. natural history is something that today I'm passionate about, and I think uh, it's my retirement plan, if not teaching. Wow. So, so I, I I want to pick it up from that place where you're talking about natural ge- geographic. I'm also <coughs> in the media and film space, but now National Geographic is always on another level. Yes. People, it takes so much to put together mm-hmm. one story. How how has that experience been for you? And, um, and what is one of those outstanding uh, production experiences you've had? Um, first, uh, uh, just to, to get it out that uh, I don't work for National Geographic. Yeah. I'm a National Geographic explorer. Mm-hmm. And that has given me, because uh, that has taken me into mm-hmm. now the National Geographic space. What is the difference between uh, working for them and being an explorer? Because technically, uh, National Geographic doesn't have, uh, let's say, filmmakers in Kenya. Or so, uh, for for being an explorer, first of all, is um, there's science explorers, there's storytelling explorers, there's um, uh, the different disciplines. So National Geographic was mostly, most people who used to apply for their grants were scientists because they're giving you a grant to pursue your scientific research and all that. And then I think they noticed there were no more, uh, there were few journalists who were applying and filmmakers. So we had a training, uh, were about 15 from East Africa. And then from there on, I applied for a grant, uh, and then I got it. So once you get the grant, you become an explorer. Mm-hmm. And now that uh, gets you into that space where you get opportunities from National Geographic, because I've had different trainings from National Geographic. Mm-hmm. Um, the most recent one was uh, something called um, Field Ready Program, where they take young filmmakers from different countries, because you know, nature documentaries are produced in different parts of the world. Mm-hmm. And uh, back then, it used to be a whole team flies in from a different country. Yeah. So what National Geographic is trying to do is picking uh, storytelling explorers mm. and building their capacity to be able to now start filming, uh-huh. 
to help in that and uh, and through that uh, field ready program i was i was uh, lucky enough to join a team in uh, in um, in in uh, Olpegeta where we were filming uh, some insect an ant and uh, for a series that is called supernatural that is on disney plus and national geographic and um good thing about it it was it has been nominated has three nominations for this year's emmy so that's something wow. to celebrate but i was i was i was in that team as someone who's learning so i was there uh, KYM. Yes. Yeah. Come here, go there. <laughs> My work was come here, go there. Yeah. 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 Shake this tree, do this and do that. Uh, hold them, the crane and all that. So this is to the young producers and the upcoming producers and and, <coughs> and some of us who've not had such opportunities. But mm-hmm. being that you've been on different production sets, you've done different documentaries, both locally and internationally, mm-hmm. is there any difference between the when you're thinking about it in terms of i don't want to call it work ethic Mm -hmm. but just the pre-planning and the production processes that goes into maybe like something like that that you film in all project versus Mm -hmm. some of these stories that we do here locally was there any difference yeah there's a big difference and i think uh one is because of resources uh, because before the 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 one that because we were we we were in all all pejeta for almost a month and it was filming ants, and that uh, sequence because it's a it's a forty five minute uh, do, uh, series like Tazama. Mm. It has different parts. Mm. That sequence is only six minutes, but we stay there for a month. Prior to that, the first one that I went to in Bala Research, they had stayed there for three months. I was there for a week just to to get to see how they film and all that, mm. but they were there for three months. A whole team. To film yeah. something that was supposed to be four minutes mm. but it never it actually didn't go like it didn't make it to the final series but you can imagine they stayed there for three months three to months. shoot that and it's a costly affair so i think mm. one of the reasons as to why ours is usually rushed is also the resources Cost, because you yeah. you can imagine staying at that place for even a month you've hired red equipment mm. Red cameras. You've yes. uh, you've flown in people from people. abroad, and they're there for three months. They're there for three months. Yes. And by the way, those who are wondering, Maurice mentioned Tazama. Tazama actually mm-hmm. was a documentary, current affairs documentary program. That that is actually mm-hmm. one of the places where we met, and we did a couple of stories. In fact, Maurice and I mm-hmm. did a story in in Turkana, yes. on 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 child soldiers. Yes. One of these findings will share that story. But but just moving on, so that I wind up that <coughs> whole journalism so that we can get to the to the heart of the matter. Mm-hmm. What story is that that won you that Thonson, Thonson Foundation Award? Uh, there were three stories. Yeah. So I did a blog about food waste mm-hmm. and um, just food waste and how we waste, we waste food in our homes and all that and how that connects to climate change. Uh, connecting it to the Dandora Dam site, the perennial fires that are always, there's always a smoke. Mm. So uh, you used to think it's uh, someone lights it up, but we, we had to, we spoke to scientists from NEMA who, who told us it's it's a chemical reaction, kinetic reaction, I think. That's mm. what I can't remember the mm. scientific details. So that story. And then there's another one about a lady uh, who used to feed uh, street children. Uh, street families, uh, her, uh, she was a university student, she was using her pocket money and doing carding at Mudaiga Golf Club to raise funds to buy meals for street families. And then the, other, the last one was the one that you're mentioning about um, insecurity in Todonyang in northern Kenya. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and by the way, the links to those stories are right below here. So mm-hmm. feel free to watch them to get a, a deeper insight on some of those stories. So, Maurice, moving on to <coughs> what brings us here. So, what's on your shelf? How would you describe your shelf? How do I describe my shelf? Yeah. Ah, I don't know how to describe it because it has it has uh, almost every genre of books, uh, but I tend to, um, to like more of non-fiction. I don't know. I think it's because of the work that I do. I read more on non-fiction. But I also have some fictional uh, 
books that I really love and also African writers, contemporary African writers and also the OGs like yeah. Ngogi Wationgo and uh, of course, you know, you can talk about the OGs without mentioning um, Chinua Achebe. So, Achebe. so uh, I think uh, I'd, I'd call it, it's a rainbow of, of, of almost everything. Mm. Yeah, because I have fiction, yeah. I have African fiction, I have uh, non-fiction. I have biographies, I have yeah. just books on life and like general uh, life things and yeah. everything. So, so were, you, were you always a reader or it's a habit you developed? Um, I think it's, um, it's something that was instilled in me while gr- growing up. Um, and my sisters used to, uh, I remember I was, I think, I can't remember which class I was in. But I remember my sister talking about Amezidi. I think she was, it, it was helping her to remember. So she was telling me that story and it, it was really fascinating the way she was telling me the story. Mm. So I always had that, I, I wanted to read that book. Though I didn't read Amezidi, I read Aminata at some point, I yeah. think. And um, uh, Betrayal in the City. Mm. So those were set books that were for... Francis Mbuka. Yes, yeah. for for um, my older uh, siblings, mm. but I found them in the house, and I used to to read them uh, to read them at when I was still in primary school. We used yeah. to exchange books with with neighbors. I think it was a fancy thing to do that time. Mm. Uh, you read a book, you get uh, you, you you get it to someone else. They give you a book. We used to go to the library to hang out there uh, during holidays. So that we can hang out with girls and all that, but I think it also it rubbed on me, and now I I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't a reader. In fact, even the set books that we were doing in high school, I don't think I read half. And um, <coughs> the 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 mature me has found so much in books, and I've slowly been starting to build that mm-hmm. culture of just reading and and just the fascination mm-hmm. that you have in your mind. When you when when you have to imagine the text of a story you're reading, and some of them you can almost visualize some of those things, and I think that is what has has made me even want to do this podcast. And I'm and I'm and I'm I'm desiring to sit with people who've read more than I have, mm-hmm. as I get to learn and I I continue to to firm up that reading culture even in, in myself. And and one of the key things that I've seen on your shelf mm-hmm. is a set book. That I did, actually, by one of the greatest African writers, Chinua Achebe, a man of the people. Mm-hmm. So, so what, what's, what's your thought on a man of the people? Ah, it takes me back to high school. Mm. Because I also did, uh, did the, the, the same book as my, 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 um, my set book. And um, it's, it's the reality. Uh, the, 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 the thing about the book is the reality of what it is today. Like, it's like... Chinua Achebe was painting the political uh, scene that we are living in today. Yes. However many years ago that book was written, yes. it is still relevant today. And uh, sometimes I look at the politicians and when they stand on a podium to speak and they just see, this is who Chinua Achebe was talking about. Yeah. Like, you hear about their stories of plantes, you hear the stories of uh, mistresses and all that, and it's everything that is in that book. So yeah. it's... I think it's 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 just a reflection. What was the most outstanding thing for you in this book? Uh, I don't know. I think because I'm more into politics mm. and current affairs and just the uh, the running of uh, governance, like a govern a, a country that works. Yes. So for me, I think it was more on the political side and the politicians trying uh, the corruption bit of it because there was so much corruption. The, the politicians were so corrupt. Mm. So for me, I think that is something that stood out in the book. Yeah. Um, at that time, I think as well. There, there are things you would see and see hypocrisy. I think there is a mm. place where, where I think a minister, it, I read it quite a long time ago. It's me more too. Than, actually, me it's too. close to 20 years yes. ago. Yes. And and, and there's, I remember there is a part where he was talking about this minister who, who sipped their locally brewed coffee mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and spat and, mm-hmm. and could not believe what what is this that I've just stated yet he was the minister mm-hmm. who was actually supposed to ensure that their country is producing such a beautiful 
product. But you see, uh, 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 it's uh, because he started because he had now acquired an expensive test. An expensive test. And uh, just look at our cabinet secretaries today. Yeah. Uh, Last year, in uh, yeah, probably in May, if you looked at what watch someone like a cabinet secretary who will not mention their names because I know like two who have uh, today have watches that cost more than thirty thousand US dollars. So like you get that position and then you now acquire a test that is so expensive you can't put on a cheaper thing like like this. And the problem is where is that money coming from? Mm-hmm. Your salary cannot sustain that like that you, you you look at that watch is probably a hundred thousand US dollars who has that money to buy a watch, a at, watch. in you you've been an, a, a member of parliament mm. and now you're just a cabinet secretary and the first thing we see less than a year you have this very expensive test in watches and mm. you know watches can be very very expensive watches can some be people use it to uh it's, like, a, it's a statement of class a statement of class and a way to save your money as well because now when you have the money like that's how money laundering works as well because when you buy a watch for 110,000 shillings mm. 10,000 US dollars it uh, it, it doesn't uh, you can stay with it for more than 10 years and sell it you get back your money so that's how some people launder money by buying very expensive like you see someone with more than 10 uh, very expensive watches. It's sometimes not just the fancy bit. Bit of it. Yeah. There's so much hidden into There's it. There's so much hidden into it. Wow. Yeah. And, 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 and there's another book that... Um, yeah. Kachinchin. A Long Way Gone. Mm-hmm. It says this true story of a child soldier. Mm-hmm. Tell me about this. So uh, that's uh, an autobiography by Ishmael. Um, he was a child soldier in Sierra Leone, and the book talks about the. Um, it's all about the political, uh, the the war in in Sierra Leone, how it started, how he was affected, how his family was affected. Like uh, when they invaded their village, he had gone to play football, uh, in some vill- some another in in another village, and by the time they were coming back with his brother. Uh, the entire village, they had killed people in their village. I, I, I think he, I can't remember if, uh, because I read it a while back, I can't remember if his parents were killed or they disappeared, but he never met them again. And uh, he just talks about that journey, how he became a, a child soldier, how they were raiding communities, they were raiding villages, stealing, killing, raping people. Um, but towards the end, um, I think there's an organization that started picking out young boys because he was still young, mm. uh, taking young boys and trying to do rehabilitation. He was taken in. He went back to join the, the military militant group and he was a child. Mm. Um, but I think somehow he went back again. He was picked and went back and uh, he got a sponsor. So he went to the States to, to continue with his education and... Uh, at the end, it turns out positively for him, but it's a very sad story for because I was reading it and thinking about myself as a child, if mm-hmm. that happened to me yeah. as a child, or yeah. if that happens in this country, how is it going to to be to anyone? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But now, when you when you when, when in the in with that lens, mm-hmm. and I would say Kenya went through a post-election violence. Mm-hmm. Actually, I would say that is that is one of the. The wars I can talk about because mm-hmm. I saw it. I, I at that point I lived in in Huruma in Nairobi, mm-hmm. which is very cosmopolitan. All the tribes because it was a tribal affair, mm-hmm. and there are people to date I can tell you for a fact who are my friends who I, I have never seen. I don't know where they went to. I don't even think some of them survived the, mm-hmm. the, the, the violence. Mm-hmm. Myself, I think. I, I escaped narrowly mm-hmm. circumstances that would have turned fatal on three different occasions over that same season. And and that has left a lot of fear in my heart, mm-hmm. especially when you look at the current political situation in the country mm-hmm. with people talking about protest and political uprising and people seeming mm-hmm. to, leaders uttering very careless statements that would easily mm-hmm. turn the country into a war zone. 
when you look at the political situation in Kenya, do you have? Uh, I I I tend to to feel that uh, we are lucky enough to have a very strong constitution. So at times it shields us from escalating towards um, that direction. And also, unfortunately or fortunately, the 2007-2008 post-election violence has made all of us to be aware, like most people are aware. Mm -hmm. Like you can already see red flags and you can already, people speak about it because at the end of the day, the most affected people during the post-election violence were the communities, the people in them tar. Yeah. It's not someone in Karen or uh, they were affected by not able by not being able to buy airtime or to w walk into their favorite supermarket. Mm -hmm. But the people who were affected, who were injured, people who lost family, people who lost property were the people in them tars in uh, Madare, yeah. in uh, Kibra, like if you go to Western Kisumu, Kondele. Yeah. So, and I tend to believe these people are aware nowadays, are more aware that if things escalate, yeah. we are the ones who are going to to face the music. Mm -hmm. So there's always that conversation. I know even during this, uh, during the Mandamana, when things were escalating in, in, in Kibra, there was a church was, which was burned and there was a mosque, I think, that was attacked. Yeah. The community came together very fast yeah. to have a conversation about what is really happening and who is causing this because yeah. at the end of the day there are some people who come to cause it yeah. and make it look like it's a community thing but it's one person who wants to bring that chaos mm -hmm. so uh i feel we are more aware but you know you can't but tell some, yeah but because sometimes we ask us what is the balance because you you also don't want to feel like i am the non-participating citizen when mm -hmm. people are, are, are walking around in civil protest and mm -hmm. they are voicing their concerns on or maybe bad leadership, or, mm -hmm. or like, for example, right now, everybody is feeling the cost of living. Mm -hmm. It's skyrocketing. Commodity prices have skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes you don't want to be the one who remained in the house when mm -hmm. other people were out there. But from your writing, from your experiences out there mm -hmm. in the fields, what, what, what is the role of a citizen in such situations? Um, I think citizen... Mm -hmm. We play different roles, like the, the 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 way you're saying, like your work through your work, uh, you're highlighting a a, a corruption incident, you're highlighting uh, a case of police brutality. I think that is your way because at the end of the day, we all want a better a better country. We want to make our our country safe. We want to make our country work for us. So. Every person, I think, works in their own way because there are people who cannot go out for to a protest because of uh, probably the previous protest they went to it turned violent or even if it's not violent, then they don't have the capacity to go to walk out on the streets. Mm -hmm. But they voice their concerns because we have like the public barazas, we have like um, uh, there's also uh, talking to your leaders online. There's so many ways you can reach out to yeah. you, you can voice your concerns mm -hmm. and make the country work. So I, I don't think we can we are limited to say protest that i have to go for a protest yeah. for me to make my voice heard i i i want to support the person who's going for the protest but mine i'm i'm doing a b c d so all of us can participate yeah. but in our different own ways okay yeah. so i want to move to the next book and the one that caught my eye mm -hmm. is this <clears throat> one tomorrow i'll be 20 mm -hmm. by Elaine mabanku mabanku mm -hmm. Tell me about this one. Um, it's a book that I like because it was written from a child's perspective. Uh, and it's really funny because it has like funny nuggets in it. And um, one thing I think I liked about it, it was talking about uh, Congo and uh, that... Um, Alain Mabanku is Congolese? Yes, but now lives in, in, in France. Okay. So... It, he was talking about that setup, but what really uh, was funny for me and interesting in the book was um, the child's view of the world because it was uh, in between the book. There were the he he used to listen to BBC News with his parents, with his I think his dad and his grandmother. I, I read it a while ago, but 
So his perspective of what was happening, because there are real world issues that have been mentioned there, like the Palestine and the Israeli um, conflict has been mentioned there. A couple of things about Israel and uh, Russia, uh, presidents and leaders of the world who died. But now you, he's talking it from a child's perspective mm. about a world that he has no idea about. So he's talking about Russia and something that is happening in Russia in a child's perspective. Mm. Uh, for me, that was very interesting. And I, I love current affairs. So I think that's why I love the book. I'm hearing what you're saying in terms of imagining. Mm -hmm. But I want, to, I want to bring it to you and, and mm. say... What are some of those things in that context mm -hmm. that you you lived as a child mm -hmm. that maybe now as an adult you wish you would go back there and I don't know uh, just but connect with what uh, I think what was also connecting me to the book was the fact that uh, growing up listening to news in our house was like you have we, we had to listen because of course we had one radio mm -hmm. and uh we had to listen my dad used to listen at um 6 30 pm mm -hmm. we used to listen to i, I don't know if it's bbc swahili mm -hmm. and then seven we listen to the news and then matangazo malu matangazo ya vifo kbc mm -hmm. and then after that we listen to now voa so i i'm not sure if it was voa first at 6 30 mm -hmm. And then 8.30 BBC, because it was, we used to listen to BBC Swahili and v, Voice of America Swahili. Yeah. So, and Voice of America Swahili and BBC Swahili, we used, it, it was always the world view. So you're, you're hearing about uh, Arafat, you're hearing about yes. the wars, the, the wars that were used to, the Bosnia war, because I remember I was a child during yes. the Bosnia war, I can hear about the Bosnia war. Chechnya, like this. Yes, like, Chechnya. And, and, yeah. and by the way, we, I don't, I don't, yeah. why did we have to listen to a lot of international news? Because I think I, I met Saddam Hussein on radio. Yes, Saddam Hussein. And, and, yes. and, and this yeah. prime minister, Atal Behar Vajpayee. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I remember I used to wonder, the first time I used to wonder, who is this? Who calls yes. himself all those names? Yeah. And, and, and I, feel like, I feel like back then, mm -hmm. radio was the thing. Yes. Do you think it's the same today? Yes and no mm. depends with location because in in the communities like if you go to to Bungoma to Kakamega people listen to radio like mm. that is their comp and then nowadays we have it we have them on phones and then we have local radio stations I think the reason as to why we might think people are not listening to radio is because it has been decentralized so much mm -hmm. because if I'm in Kakamega I'm listening to uh, Mulembe FM. If I'm in uh, uh, Murang, I'm listening to Kameme FM. Or oh, there, there's Kameme FM, there's Mulembe FM. But when you go in that particular location, you find there are also several radio stations mm -hmm. for that particular community. Mm -hmm. So it has been decentralized so much, and to the point that we feel people are not listening to radio, but communities are listening to radios because yeah. that's where they get to hear Matangazo Avifo. They get to hear Matangazo Malum because yeah. people still do uh, obituaries on radio. But with what, what are some of your favorite radio shows when you were growing up? When I was growing, I don't know. I used to like news for some reason because I used to imitate newscasters yeah. and reading news and Matangazo Yavifo. You used to like Matangazo Yavifo. Matangazo Yavifo and Matangazo <laughs> Malum so that I can I can I can imitate the uh, the guys uh, in in class. Yes. And then there was, uh, I can't remember the name, but there was something about Mtunze Pundawako or Kutunze. Punda, yes. There was that and there's something else I can't remember. There was a, a, a show that was Ushikwapo Shikamana or something. Ushikwapo Shikamana. And was that, there was that show that had Nanjala. They, they was yes, that, drama. yes that's, that's the one I'm talking about. It's what not Ushikwapo Shikamana. I don't, I don't. I think it was Ushikwapo Shikamana. I remember that yeah. guy who used to speak in a very funny tone. I can't remember the who was in it, but I remember but, the program. But, but let me ask mm -hmm. you, because when you think about those things, mm -hmm. radio dramas were a thing. Because I remember now, uh, a, a funny story is that <coughs> where we grew up, mm -hmm. and, and, and um, <laughs> I don't know if I should be saying this here, the house <laughs> we used to live in were, were iron sheet walls. Yes. And and we lived in a in a in a 
what we would call a ploty, uh, mm-hmm. where where you you okay. and several and, apartments <laughs> together that are next to each other. Yes, yes. <laughs> in fact, they are not next to each other. They are they are together. <laughs> the, the, the apartments are together. And and I remember we would share a radio because mm-hmm. then a neighbor of ours, mm-hmm. whenever a radio was on before mm-hmm. we bought ours, we used to listen to hers, <laughs> and you would listen to her radio from your in, when you're in your house. And, and people used to talk to each other. You're in your house. I'm in my house. Yes. And and you could converse and have conversations. Yes. But I think one of the most outstanding things there, because I remember the radio station, then mm-hmm. at night they would put <coughs> they would put a certain radio drama, mm-hmm. and people followed it. Yes. It was a Luo radio mm-hmm. drama, and mm-hmm. people followed it so mm-hmm. much. I feel like mm-hmm. radio then. Mm-hmm. had very educative content mm-hmm. as opposed to radio today what 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 are your thoughts um i, I don't know um i think it's i think that's right it's 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 fairly right because uh i listen to radio nowadays i probably it's the choice of station that i choose to listen to but uh there's no much informative the most information that i get from radio is news other than news is just uh, who this person did that like it it's i technically gutter press but 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 do you think mm-hmm. because now um you also being a journalist mm-hmm. and and a lot has changed especially in the information sharing mm-hmm. uh, uh, space and and i don't only want to talk about um one particular station mm-hmm. but the fabric in most of the stations then was information driven. Yes. And there were still bits and pieces of entertainment because I remember, by the way, mm-hmm. one of my favorite uh, programs on KBC was Muziki Wa Dhuhuri. Mm-hmm. And that is where I learned a lot of, a lot of uh, Lingala, Zilizopeno mm-hmm. uh, music. But mm-hmm. then I was a great fan of Lucky Dube. Actually, <laughs> Lucky Dube <laughs> inspired me to do uh-huh. music, mm-hmm. you know. But but do you think there is a balance that somebody can mm-hmm. put even in the entertainment and, and fast moving uh, urban mm-hmm. sounding radio stations in a way that it's it's because my personal opinion mm-hmm. I feel like we have over sexualized the radio content yeah. today yeah I think that's true but uh, something positive is now we are moving towards podcast so uh, people are choosing what to listen to. Mm. And um, in the podcast space now, I'm getting a lot of information, a lot of content that is relevant to uh, to me, to what I want to, to learn, to what I want to hear. So um, probably uh, radio will will start turning around one, yeah. once it realizes that uh, people are tuning into podcasts more because of the content that podcasts have. Mm. I don't know. It's... Yeah. it's you can never tell. In yeah. fact, I'm sure you and I can have a whole day talking about media and radio. Yeah. But I want yeah. to move to the next book. Mm-hmm. And and I think this is very <coughs> alarming. Mm-hmm. City of Thorns. Yes. By Ben Rollins. Mm-hmm. Tell me about City of Thorns. Uh, City of Thorns, it was written... I read it a long time ago. Mm. I can't remember the the job that uh, the author was doing, but yeah. it was about this whole um, refugee crisis yeah. in northern Kenya. Uh, saying nine lives in the world's mm-hmm. largest refugee camp. Yes. So it, it's talking about how uh, the refugees are treated, uh, the treatment they get from uh, mostly the Kenyan government and the aid workers who work in the in in, in that space. Uh, but I think um, I had I had um, uh, uh, a negative uh, review about the book, because, okay. uh, uh, and that comes down to how the author was generalizing about the country Kenya, mm-hmm. and how the country Kenya is denying the refugees uh, their right. Because I think it was during that time there was a conversation about uh, closing down uh, Dadab camp. camp. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the reasons he was giving, uh, like, for instance, one thing that uh, stuck to my mind today was that um, the government of Kenya wanted to, uh, had refused for um, 
for the aid um, for I think UNHCR or one of the refugees uh, organization to build houses for the refugees uh, because um, they wanted to build better houses than an average person living in Nairobi. So for me, that was like, that's not here or there. Like, I don't think the Kibaki government, actually it was during the Kibaki, because he was, he was talking about the Kibaki government, even before the conversation about closing yeah. down the, the camp started, that the Kibaki government refused to build, uh, refused UNSCR to build houses, not houses, shelter, because it's they're not apartments or anything mm-hmm. shelter um because the the government was afraid that they are going to build better houses than the average person in nairobi but uh, I, I i don't think that was um, so that was his thought yes but he made it look like it was a fact mm-hmm. yeah so 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 i don't think i i would say i have so much information on mm-hmm. the refugee situation but i remember that thing mm-hmm. because i think i was part of a, a certain conversation that mm-hmm. people were talking about repatriation of refugees especially to those who came from countries that are more settled today than they were mm-hmm. when they were refugees but mm-hmm. but maybe my my question to you is that what what is your general thought on refugees and, mm-hmm. and and i don't know if when when you're thinking about us talking about pan-africanism mm-hmm. and us talking about the ubuntu mm-hmm. and, and the conversations <laughs> around africans being africans and and, and doing things for them mm-hmm. I, I i don't want to like the term refugees mm-hmm. but what are your thoughts on on on, on refugees and 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 Based on the facts that you read, because you seem to be mm-hmm. quite disturbed with some of the, the things this guy wrote, yeah. but but do you do you think it is a problem that needs to be spoken about? Um, I I I think the refugee situation is a very delicate situation because uh, no one chooses to be a refugee. Yeah, and um, my. Personally, I wasn't for the closure of Dadaab uh, refugee camp. I don't know. I don't know the, the, the final details why the government chose to do that. But um, one thing I know is um, I don't think it is fair to force someone to go back when they're not ready because uh, of where they came from. If the, even if you feel that the situation is more is is uh, right now is fairly calm, sometimes for these people it's, it's not. And sometimes living in that camp is their opportunity to get to a better world because most of the refugees are usually, uh, some, not most, are usually connected to different parts of the world where they can now go and start their lives, um, uh, live a different life from what they were living. Some of them are usually someone who was very vocal in their community. And even if things are calm, they can't go back because there's still some threat to their life yeah. and all that. So it's a very delicate situation. And I think it's something that needs to be uh, dealt with on a case-by-case basis. But I personally, I don't feel it's it's okay to force someone to go back. Yeah, That's my opinion. I don't think it's fair because there's trauma. There's so much memories. Yeah. You left. You, everything was destroyed. If I can get a chance to start afresh somewhere else, not in the refugee camp, if I can get a, a, an opportunity to start my life afresh yeah. in a different place, I think that would be, for me, that's a positive thing than forcing them to go back uh, from where they left. Probably they lost family, they lost property, they are traumatized. Like There's so much uh, about the situation yeah. that um, I don't know. One of the books that are, that struck me mm-hmm. the first time I, I looked at your shelf was this mm-hmm. Traveling While Black mm-hmm. by Nanjala Nyabola. Mm-hmm. Tell me about Traveling While Black. Uh, Traveling While Black is um, the essays uh, from Nanjala, Nanjala Nyabola uh, just uh, talking about her experiences and giving it more context about how it feels or how... Um, certain nationalities or certain people from various parts of the world are treated while that when they're traveling there are things that you will be asked uh, for instance just starting from the point of visa application mm-hmm. the things that you asked that um, 
some nationalities are not asked especially if someone is from europe they're applying for a visa to kenya it's like a straightforward um uh case mm-hmm. but if assume today you are you want to apply for a visa to go to say sweden or france the amount of documentation that you will be asked uh it's like sometimes i i usually joke that sometimes they want even they would prefer to see your grandmother's uh, birth certificate or something like that and those are conversations that um, nanjala is talking about how she has faced that and it doesn't stop from there uh, you get a visa and when you're traveling you are also required to prove that you intend to come back i, I can remember like my first time i traveled was for the for the award uh for the Thompson Foundation award to to the UK and I think that's why I relate so much with the book. Mm-hmm. I, ha- I had been given a visa by the UK um, embassy. Like I had all the rights to travel. Mm-hmm. But at the airport in Doha the guy who was checking on our passports the moment he saw my passport Kenyan and he shouted to the lady who was making us board the flight that ensure he has a return ticket don't allow it allow him in if he doesn't have a return ticket like she has to ensure that i am i have to come back home but in my opinion the moment the uk government granted me the visa yes it is not the place of the airline because i was passing through doha because yeah. uh, i used their flight yes if i was using kq it will it will have been like nairobi london Straight to london yes yeah so and those are some of the conversations that she's talking about like you have to prove yourself more when you're traveling while you're black mm-hmm. so and and and, and it, she also talks about the refugee issue the the migration issue of how the 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 africans who have been crossing to to europe and the treatment that they they're getting some Uh, the some boats are turned back uh, and thousands and thousands have been dying at sea like the unfair and unjust treatment they're getting yeah. and it's 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 an interesting book and interesting conversation that uh, she started and 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 I, and i feel like i feel like it's a conversation that needs to be had but do do you think let me just talk about africa because mm-hmm. that is our home do you think that africans have the courage to ask those questions why are we treated that that way why are we treated so horribly because the other day we saw african presidents bundled into a bus and like for real even if they are african <coughs> presidents they would have been treated better than that i don't i don't know I don't, I, I, but uh, something that uh, gives me a little joy is mm-hmm. that now, sometimes all of us get that treatment i tre- yeah. i think when Uh, some of these people get such kind of treatment is when they realize because uh, when you have a diplomatic passport like if you're you're the president you'd never face some some of these things that uh, some of us right, and uh, some of the things that nyabola went through and she's talking about because mm-hmm. uh, speaking about the visa and the and, and the flight issue i remember this um the wife of bcj she she's the head of u un aids mm-hmm. um she's called Bianim I can't pronounce her name well but it Bianimana mm. and um they had um UN the the UN entity that she heads mm. had a conference I think it was in South America I can't remember where exactly it was but in South America mm. but can you imagine she's going to a conference that her agency has organized and she was being denied to board a flight in I, I can't remember but one of the european airports and this is a person who works he's an she's a head of a un entity they have organized a conference like you all there katazi of her and how the organization that she heads but the flight says no i don't think you you can board the flight because you don't look like someone who's going to come back or like whatever reason they give for me it was we don't think you have enough reason to come back home i don't know what reason they gave for her but the idea that you have an african passport like mm-hmm. you look the way you look and it's sometimes it's um you feel there's a there's some way you feel when you get that kind of treatment yeah. because yeah. why would you treat me like that and i think even even when you look at especially when you're traveling to to 
some of those countries in Europe and mm-hmm. stuff, even even the countries where you're just it's just a layover. Yes. It's not even your destination. You're treated so horribly, especially in the security checks and things like that. Myself, I think uh, I, I had I had I, I had a bad experience in 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 Istanbul. When I was I was I was flying one of those one of those days to mm-hmm. to to Europe mm-hmm. and I had like a six hour mm-hmm. layover and and you know sometimes you're in that airport you're wondering what am I going to be doing here for six mm-hmm. hours and you see most of the most of the things you would use in such a situations are not in your carry on bag mm-hmm. I the other bag and you're here for like six hours and and I think this place I sat. There's a, there's a guy who kept checking me out and, and I, I moved from that place to another place because at some point I realized, hey, this guy is checking me out a lot. And and, and I moved to another place mm-hmm. and, and at, finally, I think he gained courage to come and talk to me and he asked me, hi, how are you? Uh, uh, and, and in fact, the first question he asked me is, are you Nigerian? I was like, no, I'm not Nigerian. I, I think I think I felt offended. I felt like it was proper for him to ask me, hey, how are you? Where do you come from? Let it come from me. Let me be mm-hmm. the one who is saying that because because he asked it in a way that this, he, he had looked at me for a very long time. And you know, sometimes you wonder, hey, this guy is looking at me so much. Do I look like somebody you know? Have you lost a relative that looks like me or what? And then eventually when he came and, and he asked me, so, so where are you headed to? And I tell him where I'm headed to. And then he asked, are you planning on coming back? <laughs> I'm like, why? Why do you ask me? No, no, it's, it's an African thing. You guys go to Europe and refuse to come back. And I was like, you know what? It's, uh, why do I need to explain to you what I'm going to do? And you're just somebody. And, yeah. and it was not even at a security check. It was not even somebody who is checking my documents. It's somebody who has just walked to me at a restaurant ish space I was sitting in an airport. I think the, because I, I've also had a friend uh, go through that, uh, but he's Ghanaian. Uh, it was in Amsterdam. We were traveling with him. I don't know. I can't remember where we were coming from. And then we spoke with him and then we left him. And then some two guys came and like sat him down, interviewed him. Where are you coming from? Where are you going? Like, they did a proper interview that, and he he was really shaken. The good thing was, uh, he was coming back home. Like you see, when you're coming back home, yes, those it's they seem to not have a problem. They they don't have a problem when you're flying back to Africa, but when you're going to to a different Europe or the states, I, I have never understood. But I don't understand because once a country grants you the visa, yes. it's the country that has the power to deny you. To deny. Because it's actually it's you're told that the visa, but that uh, that mission is upon uh, entry. entry. It's it, like they can deny you entry. Yes. Uh, the visa does not grant you entry. It's not yes. like a hundred percent. But it doesn't make sense to me when you're stopped at an airport by a different country. Because yes. even if they bring you back, you can still take another flight. Another and, flight. So or you choose to use a different route. Yes. You so know. it doesn't make sense. But those are the things that you have to go through when you're traveling while you're black. And I think traveling while you're Nigerian now, it's worse. I think we face we face that kind of um, treatment. Yeah. But I, I, I feel Nigerians have it rough, actually, even in the continent. That's yeah. it, like now that it, it's even worse because they face it even in Africa. Looking at yourself, do you have like a favorite book? Do you have like... what What is your... What is your favorite book? Favorite book? Mm. Do I really have a favorite book here? Um, probably I do have, but it's not here. Mm. Yeah. Um, I can't see. I, I liked um, Not a Thousand Splendid Sons. There's, uh, there's a book by Khalid Husseini. Uh-huh. Ah, I did. Someone took it from here. Ah, oh. I didn't know it's not here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but there's a book by Khalid Hussein. I've forgotten them. It's a uh, kite runner. Mm-hmm. Kite runner. Oh, what is it? Yeah, it's um. That's one of my favorite books because right. because the way he writes, like he paints a picture. Like it's you're reading. It's like a movie. Of course, it's a sad story, but you can see what he's talking about happening. Like he he's a really 
good writer. Like one of the, I think he's one of the best writers that mm. I've read. There's how, something happening how, here. How do you decide what you're reading next? How do you have like a a, a planned thought process? How do you decide that this is what I want to read next? No, sometimes I just walk into a book sh- book uh, bookstore, and depending on like uh, my like the last book that I bought, I intend to read it while while I'm traveling. So I I chose an easy an easy read, mm. such something like uh, that will keep me occupied because I have like. A, a long period of time that I'll just be sitting and doing nothing. Mm. But I, I didn't want to take something that is non-fiction, so I took an, a fiction story that would will help me kill the time. Yeah. yeah. So, so do you have <coughs> any favorite authors? Favorite authors. Khalid Husseini. Uh, weirdly, uh, Dan Brown, the one who has written... Why, why the, weirdly? <laughs> yeah, because he's written the, the Da Vinci Code, mm. yeah, which is... Uh, it's a controversial book, yeah. but I like his writing. So I've I have like uh, one, two, three, four, five. I have like six of his books. Mm. Yeah, I like I like books that I have short um, short chapters that I can quickly move to the next chapters, yeah. the next chapter. But of late, people talk about um, the digital books, especially mm-hmm. audio books. What are your thoughts on? Audio books versus <coughs> physical flip page kind of books. Uh, I think for my uh, my for my attention span, I don't think I'd do good with because I'd keep on going back because I listen to podcasts yeah. and sometimes I listen it goes gets to almost the end and then I have to take it back for like thirty minutes again yeah. to start listening again. So I don't think an audio book or a digital. I think for um, for ebooks because of my eyes and, and the lighting, so I try to avoid as much as possible. What, what are some of the tips that you can give to somebody who want to build, start building a culture of reading? I think the first, uh, the, 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 I think the, for me the most important, according to me, uh, nugget would be uh, pick and read books that you love reading. Uh, it is not a crime to start a book and not go past the third chapter. Some, I've, I've done that a couple of times. Sometimes there are books here that um, I started reading in 2018 and up to date I've never finished or 2017. And there are books that I, I picked in probably 2018. I started reading. It didn't make sense to me. I dropped it, picked it in 2020 and I like I, I, I was like, where was this book? But in 2017 I started reading it and it wasn't making sense. So mm-hmm. ideally... Just pick a book, start reading. If it's not, if you find yourself not in that kind of space to uh, to move to the next page, mm. pick another book. There are so many books in this world for you to struggle with a book. Yeah. Like, there's so many of them, and it's no crime to just stop and like never open it again. Is there any book you can say has impacted you, your life, and maybe has changed something in your life? Hmm. I don't know. Oh, those are very deep questions, Mike. <laughs> I think my life is made up of all those. Uh, I, there's no book I can pick and say this is the book that did this or that. Like, yeah. I get information from all of, uh, all of them, most of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I enjoy uh, because for for um, current affairs, nonfiction. There's so much uh, information that. I get from the books mm. that I can't pinpoint that this the, I I I uh, this part of my life was changed because of that book. Okay. Yeah, but I know books have changed me, but I can't pinpoint which book. You can't say particularly yes. this one. Yes. So so do you have oh. any? Yeah, I think one book I can say one book that uh, tried to change me, but I think I fell off at some point. It's uh. it's a book that I gave someone. It's called um, Why We Sleep, and I think it's a book I'll recommend to you. It's nonfiction. It's yeah. a book that talks about why you sleep. Yeah, like uh, sleep, sleep, or it's yes, it's... why you sleep. Like okay. the reason as to why you need to sleep, okay. and the re- what makes you sleep, and how you should create a a, a, a routine, mm-hmm. and why it's important. And and the reason as to why I'm recommending that to you is because it also talks about parenting, mm-hmm. and why sleep is very important for a child. Uh, development and for their mental capability. Like the moment I read that book, I started sleeping at um, nine thirty. Mm. Yeah, like getting quality sleep. Okay. And 
Not taking just... away because one of the things you need to take away your digital stuff, your phones and all that and just either pick a book and read mm-hmm. and go to sleep. Why uh, sleep is written by who? Um uh, Matthew Walker P- he's, he's a PhD, he's a professor of uh, neurological like he's studied sleep. Okay. The now way you the way you study film. <laughs> <laughs> that now is scary because okay fine <coughs> honestly honestly I push hours honestly I push hours yes. I, I, I I need to read that book yes Maybe. you should yes because it tells you why your next day's um uh, mistakes mm-hmm. are because of today's uh, lack of sleep there's nothing like because I, I I I we usually say that I I have I don't know we call it sleep debt or I can't remember the the term we use that. Mm. I'll sleep more tomorrow, but it doesn't help. Yeah, and it it worsens as you get older. Um, the more when you get older, the sleep that you've been accumulating. It, yes, it's not accumulating; it's yeah. doing something to your brain. Uh, so as you're getting older, it it affects you more. So it, it actually recommends a nap during, like, in the afternoon. Yeah, and he had studied even an African community. I don't know if it's the Oisan or which one that mm. they usually take a nap after 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 the afternoon meal. Mm. And that community, like they live, you find uh, guys live for a very long period. Of course, it, you cannot say it's purely because of sleep, sleep yeah. but it it is connected to, to their sleep. mental capabilities. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I think I'll study them. But but are there any books you <coughs> aspire to read that maybe you've not had a chance to grab or something? Any books that I aspire to read? Um, I can't remember. <coughs> There's a book that I've, I've I've wanted to read for for a very long time. Actually, when I went to buy the uh, the one the last one, mm. I I had to pick between the two. But it's nonfiction. It's um, it's called Think and Grow Fast. Think. Thinking, think, thinking slow and fast, or something like that. I, I can't remember the exact um, title, mm-hmm. but it's a it's a book that I've wanted to read for quite some time. Someone recommended it for I think in twenty nineteen. Yeah. My desire is to to inspire us, me together mm-hmm. with other young readers, to to embrace reading. Mm-hmm. But what are some of the things you can say? You have you have learned. Mm-hmm. Generally, mm-hmm. let me say character-wise or something that you would attribute to your your uh, habit of of delving in books. I think the nuggets is first of all, <coughs> pick a book, start reading. If it is not making sense, put it away. Mm-hmm. You might pick it again in a few months' uh, time or a few days or whatever time you choose to, and it makes sense. Or even if it doesn't make sense don't uh don't struggle uh, mm. there's so many books in the world uh, pick another one start reading um don't limit yourself to <coughs> to one genre if you're struggling with uh f- non-fiction get fiction like books are a way to travel the world so yeah. you don't have to read uh barack obama's autobiography if autobiographies are not something that make you excited because for me they make me excited because I want to know who this Barack Obama is yeah. because of my um, interests. Yeah. So if you're you you're someone who like who likes reading books on romance, if you're someone who like loves reading crime uh, fiction, like just pick that genre and read the book. Yeah. Like don't limit yourself. Uh, I I I know people who say that um, I can't read motivational books. That's fine, but there's someone who enjoys reading motivational books. So yeah. don't be limited. Don't listen to what people say or people judge about what you read. So yeah. long as you enjoy that book, yeah. And, and actually, that was going to be my next question. That mm-hmm. do you do, do you sometimes get influenced to mm-hmm. read or not to read by what other people say or comment about a certain <clears> book? Yes, of course, I do get. Uh, there are books that um, I've read their um, their reviews and I've haven't bought them. There are books that I have uh, I've bought and I wish someone had said something about it uh, because I, at the end of the day you find it like a, a waste, not mm-hmm. just of money but of time. So I get influenced. Yeah. Is there, is there, <coughs> is there a book you've ever read and felt like, why did I even 
buy this book? Of course, there are books. <laughs> yes, like, like which one? Is there, is there any of them in this shelf? Um, the books that I've, I've bought and I felt like I, I would have wanted more from the author. Yeah. Uh, one of them is this. Um, this one by... Um, it's 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 very recent. Um, the press, the president's pressman, mm. and I was really interested uh, because it's uh, it's Kenyan. Yeah. So I wanted to learn more about the affairs of State House. Yeah. <coughs> Probably I had so much expectation, but at the end of the day, I think he didn't give me much that I was looking for. Mm. Uh, it it ended up being about so and so and so and so, but I wanted to to get the, the intrigues the intrigues the one. inner yeah, because i'm current I, I was reading this one by obama the mm. promised land and yeah. it it talks about his time in uh, his time as the president and he gives nuggets about some of the decisions that we were seeing like some of the g8 summits that we've seen photos the we've seen news items but now he was giving us a deep understanding so mm. i expected um the pressman to yeah. also give me something about the Moise Into regime, yeah. Moise government that yeah. I would like, ooh, this is something that I wanted to know. But um, for me, I feel probably I, I, he didn't do that. But mm. I, I'm sure someone else found it very interesting and very uh, informational. You've spoken about Barack Obama, yes. who is, I think a lot of, has gotten very good reviews on his books. But this particular one <coughs> is a book I think I have interest on. Mm-hmm. Dreams from my father. Mm-hmm. Dreams from my father has been spoken widely about, mm-hmm. and I think I have a bias because Obama's father mm-hmm. is Kenyan. Mm-hmm. So, 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 tell me about dreams from my father. What, what, what is your, what is your, what are your thoughts on this book? Can you get it signed for me? I'll find Barack mm-hmm. sometime soon. Uh-huh. And um, now that he's out there, yes, that is one of the books I want to get signed. So, yeah. yeah. So if you can get it done for me, I'll pay you. All right. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, book for me, and just to understand who Barack Obama is um, before the presidency, before he ever knew that he's going to even because I think he wrote it even before running for Senate, but he was, um, he had r- run for office uh, uh, back in, uh, I think, Chicago. So it talks about um, basically his upbringing, um, his life, the times he met his father, and then the time that they moved to Indonesia and uh, how that life was, and um, just generally his relationship with his grandparents because uh, he used to live with them, and then his relationship with his father, when the father visited him, uh, when he was now, I think he was 12, or he, was, um, he wasn't was a small child, and the conversations that they had during that time, and how those conversations also shaped him, because I think his father was someone who was very strict, and he wanted things to be done in a certain way, and I think he had gone back, he had gone to the U.S., at a time that he was facing a lot of challenges in Kenya, I think he had been sacked or something had happened with him in Kenya. So he had gone there for for some time, and I think also that um, fr- that frustration also was first uh, manifesting on how he was dealing with with young Barack Obama, uh, the son. And it's just an interesting conversation to see how um, that had shaped. Um, Barack until when he grew up, he became, um, he became a teenager and in into his youthful uh, years when he visited Kenya the first time he visited Kenya as as a grown up, uh, visiting his grandmother back in in the um, in in is it Kenya, mm-hmm. uh, visiting Kogelo. the uh, Kogelo in, in yeah how would, I, how would I forget yes. Kogelo yeah, yes Kogelo is my home <coughs> yes. Yes. So when he visited Kogelo, um, the relationship with his uh, half brothers, because um, his his brothers, because he he talks about half brothers, but we don't talk we we don't say it here as, as no in Africa there is it, no half yes brother. because his yeah. dad had like how I think different uh, wives, and his relationship with his brothers and also his relationship with um, because his dad also had a 
a white wife i think i can't remember if she was from the uk mm. and the relationship that barack had with the brothers from that side and the relationship we had with wakna malik and uh, omar like the different relationship and it was, it's just an interesting um look into the life of barack obama i think about it what role mm-hmm. from your reading mm-hmm. do you think obama's father played in maybe shaping Barack to whoever he ended up becoming. And and do you think that a father mm-hmm. has, I don't want to say responsibility, mm-hmm. the, has the power mm-hmm. of shaping a child to something or becoming something? Yeah, definitely, because um, the way you bring up a child is how they, they turn, like what you instill in them as especially in terms of values mm. in terms of virtues in terms of um how you look the how the way you look the society is the way probably t- uh, your child will look uh, society in the same way if you're someone who um thinks um you 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 need to make it in life no matter how it doesn't matter so long as the the, the, the end justifies the means or how is yeah. it yeah, if you look at, at it that way, and it's, it's going to rub on your child. But if you're someone who feels that uh, we have to, if we have to make it, we these are the, this is the way and this is the right way. So I think uh, because his, his father, despite his own personal challenges and everything else, he was someone who was very dedicated to his job. He was dedicated to seeing um, the country, Kenya, uh, being a better place because it was just after independence and during that period where uh, people are trying to find Kenya was trying to find a footing on its own uh, building stuff and all that kind of like just building the nation that Kenya is today like he really wanted a Kenya that was uh, a better place for all of us that a Kenya that worked for for Kenyans and I think that rubbed on Barack because it shaped his initial political uh, thinking and his desire to just have a world that is a better place mm. but when, when you look at it uh, with the with, uh, uh, this current generation do you think fatherhood has changed is there is there a difference in what fatherhood used to be let me say mm. 20 30 years ago as it is today definitely it has changed because um right now i think um the generation of young fathers are more aware about um, <clears throat> what is happening in the in the lives of their children. Mm-hmm. They are more um, because <coughs> sorry, some of us having a conversation. But for me, I, I think mine was different. I used to have a conversation with my father, but mm-hmm. not most people used to have like you just sit down and talk to your father about yeah. anything and everything. It used to be. Like your father is it's like a disciplinary. Is, yes. Yes. No conversation with him. Like you can't have a light-hearted conversation. No. no. There are people who were brought up that way, but right now, the young fathers are having this conversation with their with their with their with their children, which is. Which but is also, good. there is. There, <coughs> I I I I operate in a space. I deal with a lot of young people, mm. and uh, a lot of young the young people who uh, who I work with are people. Who who some of them were in crime, some mm-hmm. of them have done drugs. And honestly, from I wouldn't say this is any scientific research, but mm-hmm. based on the number of the people, the, the youth that I have interacted with, some of whom are in the programs that I run, mm-hmm. most of them have issues with their father. Mm-hmm. Most of them don't have a relationship with their father. Mm-hmm. And and for you, for example, and 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 I would say I'm I'm glad and I'm happy to hear that you had a relationship with your father. Mm-hmm. What impact do you think having a relationship with your father has had on you as a person? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm, I just I, I think it's just shaping um, shaping who I am, how I think. Um, but I also think uh, probably why you're saying that the statistics are different. Mm. The family setup right now is a bit complicated. is is a is a bit delicate as compared to uh, back then because uh, growing up it wasn't uh, divorce wasn't something that we could hear of. Mm. But nowadays it's it's a normal. If it's not working, if a marriage is not working, 
uh, if someone is abusive because back then if a par- one of the part- uh, partners was abusive like they would still live together as married couples so mm. and and uh, some people were brought up in those kind of um families mm. and i don't know personally i feel it does more harm i don't know it's not scientifically i can't say that i have facts about how it affects someone yeah. but I, personally i think <clears throat> i would say so because um, I, I i i related a lot with the movie fences Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think uh, there's this ho- home mm-hmm. setup. A lot of people did not like it, but I think it's one of fences by Denzel, Denzel Washington. Okay. And 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 I think I think I I I resonated so much mm-hmm. with that. Where um, and I feel the same situation is there, especially for the male child today, mm-hmm. where the emotional part, the feeling is not really mm-hmm. thought about you, sh- you it is a weakness mm-hmm. if you if you're a man and you're talking about feeling and and today i feel like we have many broken young men mm-hmm. because there isn't a feeling conversation mm-hmm. and and for very many as much as we're talking about the evolution of the family setup, there are certain realities that uh, uh, are there with us today. Mm. For example, <clears throat> I think people have access to information today, especially children, have access to so much information as opposed to when I was young, mm-hmm. when I was growing up 8, 10, 15 years. Mm-hmm. I don't think my five-year-old today uh, has I, I I feel like she has more information than I had when I was ten or twelve. That's true. And 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 that shapes how this child reasons, shapes mm-hmm. and and the ability to ask questions. And to some <coughs> people, and I would say it was always a crime to question your yes. father, especially your father. You did not have. How do you start asking him? A question, and, and and I think most people, especially in the African setup, relate well with that. Mm-hmm. Do you think that helped in shaping discipline? Because there are a lot of people who allude to that fact that that harshness, that firmness, that strong, aggressive father shaped discipline. I don't. I I I think it just left uh, kids. Uh, with trauma and uh, all those negative stuff because I consider myself fairly disciplined mm. but I wasn't I, the last time I was kenned I think it, my it, it's my mother who kenned me mm. and I can't remember because I was I had done something stupid I had left home went to the market with some boys who you <laughs> never used to go to school so we met with my mom <laughs> yeah. so we went back home and it was a it, it was a long distance yeah. a place that we had to cross the road and all that so mm. that's the ta- the last time i remember her caning me i don't remember any time my father caning me so um and i believe i, I turned out fairly okay mm. um beating someone for for the mistake they've done i don't think it helped we were caned in primary school but it, it we always felt that I, 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 I probably should change school. Mm-hmm. That was the thing that I always, I feared teachers. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it was fair for us to, we, I couldn't even ask a question. If I didn't understand, I couldn't even say that I didn't understand because of the fear that um, it will be known that you were you're not stupid. listening. Mm-hmm. No, you are not listening because yeah, the problem you're is attentive. you're not attentive. But it's we we have different levels of how fast we learn some of us are not fast learners yeah i i wouldn't understand as fast as someone who is um a, a fast learner so but we never had to question because the moment you raise your hand to say that um i didn't understand that it is taken as you are not attentive and you are not attentive you're like so i don't think it was helpful i wouldn't want to see a child being beaten or an a chap of book of sabo jelewa ama sabo maulizo swali yeah 
I believe in bringing up them, bringing someone up in an environment that they can question anything. And when people question stuff, they learn and they know what is right and what is wrong. They don't fear. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it is easier for you to know something is wrong from, uh, from a child when you make it open for them to be comfortable to ask you questions and mm-hmm. tell you stuff yeah. than when you make it like a, a dictator. You'd, probably you'll know, mm-hmm. but after a while. Yeah. Because if something is wrong with a child, you'll know. But at, after how long? If you've, you haven't created that environment for them to come and tell you that uh, I don't think this is right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Maurice. And, and, and I think it's been amazing to take a journey through your shelf. And um, I wouldn't say this is the last time I'm next sitting next to your shelf, but I look forward to maybe having this conversation again. Maybe you'll have changed the shelf. Maybe there will be more other things to talk about. But thank you so much for allowing us into your space. Thank you so much for allowing my audience to sit next to your library and listen to the places you've traveled and, and the, the, the thoughts and, and quotes and all the wisdom you've gathered over the last couple of years. And of course, it has been interesting to journey with you through those books. I wish we had time for more because there's still so many books here that I'd want to talk about that I can look at. For example, uh, Wangari Madai, who is the first Kenyan uh, Nobel Peace first, Prize. First African woman. First African woman to win a Nobel Prize. And and I think if I started a conversation on that, it would be another <laughs> conversation altogether. But yeah. thank you so much also for, for, for journeying with me through this podcast. And I hope you've picked something, you've picked a habit, or perhaps you've spotted a book that is going to make your next read. It's been interesting to sit with Maurice, a very, very thorough journalist. Check out some of his stories. The links are down here on, 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 on this video. And I hope that you will enjoy reading and watching his stories as much as we've enjoyed having this conversation with him. What are you reading? What's on your shelf? See you again on the next one. <laughs>